Hello, this video includes an introduction to solutions and also solubility. So when we talk about a solution, a solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture, okay? It's gonna be made up of two or more substances. And when we look at solutions, there are two components. We have the solvent, okay, which is a substance that's usually in the greatest amount. And we have the solute, which is everything else that would be in the solution. And sometimes there's only one solute. Sometimes we may have more than one solute in a solution. So this is just a picture here. We've got um, a solid here. Okay, this is potassium dichromate. We have some water here. When we take the potassium dichromate and we dissolve it into the water, we make a solution of potassium dichromate. Now, there are all different types of solutions. The, the classic one that we think about is when we have a solid dissolved in a liquid. We have sodium chloride dissolved in water, salt dissolved in water, okay? But there are all different kinds of solutions. We could talk about um, mixtures of gases. Okay, the air that we breathe is a mixture, okay? It's made up primarily of nitrogen gas, but then there are all the other gas mixed in with the nitrogen gas. And all those other gases are the solute component of air. And oxygen is the major solute in air. Okay, when we talk about sodas, soft drinks, okay? That's carbon dioxide, which is a gas, dissolved in water, which is a liquid. Okay, if we talk about hydrogen in a palladium, that's a gas dissolved in a solid. Okay, we could have water and alcohol mixed together to make rubbing alcohol. That's two liquids in a solution. Or we could have um, two solids like zinc and copper can be mixed together in a solution. It's called an alloy. Brass is a, a mixture of zinc and copper. And when we look at solutions, solutions have the following traits. Okay, they're homogeneous or homogeneous. And what that essentially means is after the solute or solutes have dissolved in the solvent, it's a uniform composition. The solute is evenly distributed within that solvent. Okay, the um, solution is typically the state that the solvent was in, solid, liquid, or gas. The components of the solution are um, mixed up or dispersed at the molecular level. Okay, the atoms, the molecules, the atoms are evenly distributed um, within that solution. And if we were to let a solution sit for a period of time, the solute isn't going to separate or settle out from the solvent. And the composition of a solution okay, can vary. Okay, we can have solutions that are very concentrated, meaning we have a lot of solute relative to the amount of solvent. We could have solutions that are very diluted, meaning we have a very little amount of solute relative to the amount of solvent. So we need to talk about how we make solutions and the energy that's associated with that. So when we talk about making solutions, we're looking at spontaneous processes, which means that the solution is going to be formed whether energy is added in or not. And when we talk about solutions being formed, okay, they're favored, but not necessarily guaranteed when we have a decrease in the internal energy of the system. In other words, energy is released or we're looking at an exothermic process or we're increasing the entropy or the disorder in the system. And we're gonna spend more time on this disorder in the next chapter. So an ideal solution is a solution that forms where there's essentially no energy change. In other words, the strength of the intermolecular forces 
between the solute and the solvent particles in the solution is the same as the intermolecular forces between the solute particles by themselves and the solvent particles by themselves. So a good example of an ideal solution might be taking two ideal gases and mixing them together, or taking two liquids that are very similar structurally and mixing them together. So here we've got some helium and we've got some argon in a closed valve. And if we were to open up uh, the valve, the, some of the argon will move into this container and some of the helium will move into this container. And eventually we will have an even distribution of helium and argon. And that process would take place spontaneously. Now, energy. There's three things that are gonna need to take place in order for us to make a solution. The first thing that has to happen is the solute particles have to kind of get spread out. We have to break some of the intermolecular forces that are holding the solute particles together. And we kind of expand those solute particles. That's an endothermic process. We have to add energy in in order to prepare the solute to dissolve in the solvent. What also has to occur, and these all occur simultaneously, but what has to occur next is the solvent particles also have to expand. Some intermolecular forces have to break. The solvent particles have to spread out so that there's room for the solute particles to fit in between. And again, because we're breaking intermolecular forces, this is an endothermic process. We have to add energy in. So we're adding energy in to get the solute ready to dissolve. We have to add energy in to get the solvent ready to dissolve the solutes. And then the last thing are the solute particles and the solvent particles are gonna interact with each other. They're gonna form new intermolecular forces between the solute and the solvent particles. And the forming of those intermolecular forces gives off energy. It's an exothermic process. So how much energy do we have to add in compared to how much energy do we get back is what's gonna determine whether or not the dissolving process overall is endothermic or exothermic. So when we talk about making a solution spontaneously, it's favored by that exothermic dissolution of the solute particles into the solvent particles. We kind of have this graphical representation here. So the first thing, so the first thing that happens is we're going to add some energy in to prepare the solvent to dissolve. Okay, that's going to have a positive delta H value. We're gonna add some energy in to prepare the solute to dissolve. That's gonna have a positive delta H value. So now the solvent particles are ready to dissolve the solute. The solute particles are ready to dissolve in the solvent. So now we make our solution we're gonna get a lot of energy back when the solute particles and the solvent particles interact with each other. Our enthalpy change is gonna be negative because it's an exothermic process. In an exothermic dissolving process, the sum of the energy that we have to add in to get the solute and the solvent prepared to dissolve is gonna be less than the amount of energy we get back when the solution actually forms. And that's where we get that enthalpy of solution value. So the energy of the solution is lower than what the solute and the solvent were separately. And the dissolution process is driven by the fact that we're losing energy, we're lowering the energy and we're increasing the disorder in the system. The particles are more disordered in the solution than they were when they were just the solvent and the solute 
separately. Now, when we look at this process, the spontaneous solution formation is favored, but it's not guaranteed. While many soluble compounds do dissolve and release heat, some don't. Perfect example, if you've ever used um, an instant cold pack, okay, something that you have um, maybe in a first aid kit. Essentially what it is, is there is a packet of water, okay? And then outside that, there's a compound like ammonium nitrate. And when you break the water in this bag, the ammonium nitrate dissolves in the water. And this is an endothermic process. It absorbs energy from the surroundings. That makes the surroundings feel colder. Okay, your ankle that you sprained is gonna feel colder because energy is gonna be absorbed from your ankle into the cold pack. We've seen, we've talked about in Chem 1 or in, in other classes that you've taken, this, this kind of saying like dissolves like. And that's a general rule for what kind of solute dissolves in a given solvent. So when we talk about solvent-solute interactions, it's dependent on what kind of solute and what kind of solvent we're dealing with. Materials that have similar intermolecular forces tend to be soluble in each other. So a nonpolar solute will dissolve in a nonpolar solvent or a polar solute will dissolve in a polar solvent because they have similar intermolecular forces. Substances dissolve when the solvent-solute attraction is stronger than the original solvent-solvent and the original solute-solute forces. So an example, oil, is a nonpolar solute, okay? It only has London dispersion forces. Well, water is a polar solvent. It has hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. So we have nonpolar and polar trying to mix together. Oil and water don't mix because they don't have similar intermolecular forces. Ethanol has hydrogen bonding and water has hydrogen bonding. Ethanol dissolves in water because they have similar intermolecular forces. Now, how do polar molecules dissolve in polar solvents like water? So here's an example. Let's say we've got some polar solutes it doesn't really matter what it is. We should remember that polar substances have an uneven distribution of electrons due to differences in electronegativities for the atoms in that substance. So in this case, we've got a polar solute. Okay, whatever's over here is more electronegative than what's over here. So we've got a partial negative side to our molecule here, and we've got a partial positive side to our molecule here. Well, when we look at water molecules, this is a water molecule, H2O, okay? This is an intramolecular force. It's a polar covalent bond. This is a polar covalent bond. It's what's holding the hydrogens to the oxygen. But oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen is, so the electrons are going to get pulled closer to the oxygen. So this side of our water molecule is partially negative. This side is partially positive. So why does a polar solute dissolve in water? Because we're going to have interactions between the negative side of the polar solute and the positive side of the water. And we'll have interactions between the positive side of our polar solute and the negative side of water, because unlike charges attract each other. Now, when we talk about this process, we're looking at what's called salvation. 
Okay, it's just a general term for when a solute is dissolved into a solvent and the solvent essentially surrounds that solute particles. When the solvent is water, it just has a special name, it's called hydration. What we need to know is that um, when we look at molecules that dissolve in water, okay, bonds are not broken when molecules dissolve. This molecule here, this polar solute stays intact if it's a molecule and it just gets attracted to the negative and the positive portion of the water molecule. Now, some terms. Hydrophilic means water loving, okay? What it really means is that that solute is attracted to water. Hydrophobic means water fearing, literally, but it means that it repels water. So some examples, if we were to look at um, vitamin A, okay, here's the structure of vitamin A, okay? It's a mostly nonpolar molecule. Water's polar. So that means vitamin A isn't gonna be attracted to water molecules. So vitamin A is hydrophobic. What it will do though, is it will dissolve in fatty tissues in our body because fats are nonpolar, like dissolves like. Now, if we were to look at vitamin C, vitamin C has a much different structural arrangement. It is a more polar molecule. Okay, we've got this OH here and this OH here and this OH here and this OH here, and we've got these oxygens with lone pairs of electrons. So we've got a very polar molecule. Again, water is polar. So vitamin C is hydrophilic. Vitamin C is gonna be attracted to water molecules because they have similar intermolecular forces. Vitamin C dissolves in water. So vitamin C can easily circulate in our blood and it can easily circulate between the cells in the intracellular fluid. When we talk about alcohols, okay, we can um, look at the relationship between alcohols and water, okay, how alcohols will dissolve in water. So here we have a little table. These are all different alcohols. A couple of things we should notice. All of the formulas have this OH group in it. So we've got an OH here, and we've got an OH here, and we've got an OH here. That's the functional group that classifies these molecules as alcohols. And within this molecule, this is a methanol molecule, we've got hydrogen bonded to oxygen, which means that we're going to have hydrogen bonding in this methanol, between methanol molecules. Okay. And water is um, also polar. So methanol is very soluble in water. Ethanol is very soluble in water. Propanol is very soluble in water. But once we start getting down here, the molecules are getting bigger and bigger. As we go from butanol to pentanol to hexanol to heptanol, we're adding more to the hydrocarbon chain of the alcohol. This part of the molecule is very nonpolar. So the more nonpolar we have in our alcohol, the less it's going to dissolve in water. So heptanol, which has a very long hydrocarbon chain, which is nonpolar, is only marginally dissolved in water. C6H14. Okay, this is a nonpolar solvent. It's called hexane or cyclohexane. Well, if this is nonpolar and like dissolves like, well, methanol only marginally dissolves in cyclohexane. But as we go down these alcohols, the structure is becoming more and more nonpolar and the alcohol is becoming more and more soluble 
in the nonpolar solvent. So smaller alcohols dissolve easily in water due to the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules and the, this is called the hydroxyl group, this OH, in the alcohol. The London dispersion forces in the alcohol are insignificant because there isn't much nonpolar in those smaller alcohols. But when we look at the larger alcohols, the long chain alcohols have a lot more London forces in them and they don't dissolve in water. Um, cyclohexane, okay, or C6H14, okay, will have strong London dispersion forces with most alcohols and will dissolve. And again, we just need to remember that if we were to take um, methanol and dissolve it in water, we're not going to break the intramolecular forces within this molecule. What we do break are the intermolecular forces between these molecules. And then we reform intermolecular forces between the alcohol and the water or the alcohol and the um, cyclohexane. All right, so electrolytes, um, non-electrolytes are substances that um, do not break up into ions when they dissolve. And we call them non-electrolytes because since there are no ions present in the solution, it can't conduct an electric current. But if we were to look at um, electrolytes, Electrolytes are substances that dissolve in water. And when they dissolve in water, they do break up into ions. And the presence of ions in the solution allows that solution to conduct an electric current. And that's why we call it an electrolyte. Now, there are different degrees of electrolytes. Strong electrolytes are ones in which pretty much 100% of the compound breaks up into ions when it dissolves. Weak electrolytes form when only a very small percentage of the molecules break up into their ions. We're gonna watch just a real quick video. So what we have here, here's a light bulb. It is plugged into an outlet, okay? And if we touch it to a metal, it can conduct an electric current. Okay, so what we have here Okay, if we were to take this bulb, again, it's already plugged into an outlet, and we were to put it into water, we're not completing the circuit. So we can't conduct an electric current. If we were to take this bulb and put it in contact with aluminum, metals can conduct an electric current. So we're completing the circuit and the bulb lights. If we were to take this setup and put it into sugar or put it into salt or put it into silicon dioxide, we don't complete the circuit and the bulb doesn't light. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add some water. Now we know that water isn't gonna allow that current to flow. So we're gonna put some water in with our aluminum. We'll put it in with our, this is sucrose, you know, sugar that you maybe put in your coffee. We're gonna put it in with the salt. We're gonna put it in with the, um, silicon dioxide, and we're going to make some solutions. Now, the aluminum doesn't even dissolve. So what we're going to see now is because the aluminum doesn't dissolve in the water, we're not going to be able to conduct an electric current. Now, the sugar does dissolve in the water, but the C12H22O11 stays in its molecular form. It doesn't break up into ions in solution. And since there are no ions in the solution, the electric current can't flow. We haven't completed the circuit. So we would say that this is a non-electrolyte. Sodium chloride, on the other hand, when it dissolves in water, it's table salt, it breaks up into sodium ions and chloride ions, that hydration process takes place that we looked at before. And because we have ions in the solution, 
we can conduct an electric current. So sodium chloride is an electrolyte. And then silicon dioxide is a lot like the sucrose we had over there. Um, it actually doesn't even really dissolve. So there's no ions in the solution. We're not gonna have um, a completed circuit and we're not gonna be able to conduct an electric current. So the sugar here is dissolving, but it's not forming ions. So it's considered to be a non-electrolyte. The sodium chloride here is dissolving and forming ions. So it's considered to be an electrolyte. All right, my friends. So we're gonna get ourselves started back up again. Um, so what we wanna do now is just talk about this um, dissociation process. So when ionic compounds dissolve in water, the ions in the solids separate. They disperse uniformly throughout the sol solution. Remember that it's a homogeneous mixture. And the reason it does that is because the, the water molecules surround and solvate um, the ions. Um, and it essentially prevents the ions from sticking to each other. So water and other polar molecules are attracted to ions through ion dipole interactions. So if we look at this picture here, okay, this is depicting sodium chloride. So we've, or sorry, potassium chloride. So we've got potassium ions and chloride ions. And in the solid state, the potassium ions are attracted to the chloride ions and the potassium ions are attracted to the chloride ions and so forth. But if we were to take this crystalline solid and put it into water, okay, the water molecules are gonna move in. The positive end of the water molecule would be attracted to the negative ions. And the negative side of the water molecules will be attracted to the positive ions. And they essentially just pluck the ions out and surround them. So the chloride ion will be surrounded by um, the positive end of the water molecules. The potassiums will be surrounded by the negative um, ends of the water molecules. And then what can't happen are the potassium ions and the chloride ions really can't interact with each other anymore because they've been surrounded with water molecules. Okay, if we were to look down here, just a, a different illustration, we've got you know, sodium chloride. If we look at the chloride, it would be surrounded by the positive ends of the water molecule here. Okay, if we were to look at the sodium, it would be surrounded by the negative side of the water molecules here. When we look at um, electrolytes, Sometimes covalent compounds can dissolve in water and conduct an electric current. This shouldn't be here, but, um, but the reason isn't because the ions are necessarily there to begin with. It's because there's a chemical reaction that takes place between the solute and the solvent. So as an example, here's water. Okay, this is a um, Lewis structure for water and we've got hydrogen chloride. And if we were to take hydrogen chloride and put it into water, a chemical reaction takes place. The hydrogen from this um, hydrogen chloride is gonna leave the hydrogen chloride because it's so highly attracted to these lone pairs of electrons. And it's gonna form ions. Because there are ions that are in the solution after this covalent compound dissolves in water, it's an electrolyte, okay? Now, hydrogen chloride is an acid, and the way that acids react with water is something that we're gonna be spending um, quite a bit of time on um, later on in, in this um, course. I'm gonna spend um, a couple chapters actually talking about that kind of stuff. So next, let's talk about solubility. And solubility is the maximum concentration that can be formed by a solution um, at a particular temperature. So if we have solid sodium chloride and we put it into water, okay, it's an ionic compound. It's gonna break up into ions. We're gonna form sodium ions and chloride ions. 
And as time continues, more sodium chloride dissolves into the ions. But as the concentration of the ions in the solution increases, what will start to happen is some of those ions will stick back together and reform the solid. And we're eventually gonna form an equilibrium between the rate of dissolving of the solid and the rate of precipitating of the ions. And at that point, we've reached what's called equilibrium. And the amount of sodium chloride that has dissolved at equilibrium is what we mean when we talk about solubility. So some terms. When we talk about a saturated solution, a saturated solution has the maximum amount of solute dissolved in it. So the solute's concentration is equal to its solubility. But if we have an unsaturated solution, we don't have enough solute dissolved in the solution. So the solute's concentration would be less than that solubility or that maximum concentration. And we can have what's called supersaturated solutions. Okay, those are ones that you kind of have to force them to be made um, and they're super unstable and they tend to um, go back down to their saturation point fairly quickly. Um, but you can kind of force a solution to dissolve more than it should um, at a particular temperature. So if we were to look at um, a graphical representation of this, okay, we have um, the solubility along the y-axis and the solubility is just the grams of solute for every 100 grams of water. And we have the temperature along the um, x-axis. This line here is our saturation point. Okay, this is the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve at various temperatures. If we have less than this amount, we have an unsaturated solution. And if we have more than that amount, we have a supersaturated solution. So let's look at gases. Okay, so we have our solubility here. Okay, so how much solute is dissolved in our solution, and we have our temperature here. And what we should notice is for gases, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes down. And it has to do with the intermolecular forces between the solute particles and the solvent particles. So the solubility of gases decreases as the temperature increases. Now, there are lots of environmental implications to that. Let me give you one. Um, there's something called thermal pollution. Most power plants are built along some kind of a water supply. And the reason that they do that is so that the power plant can use that external water source to cool it down. So we have a power plant, it's next to a river or lake, um, and it takes water out of that uh, river or lake, um, and it uses it to cool down the power plant, and then it pumps the warmer water back out into the environment. There's no poisons, in that water, but the temperature is slightly different. And what happens is as the temperature goes up, the solubility for oxygen gas goes down. So when the water is a little bit warmer, it can't dissolve as much oxygen anymore. And aquatic life that lives in that water and relies on the oxygen dissolved in the water actually end up suffocating. So it's called thermal pollution, and it's very regulated now. It wasn't back in the 70s and 80s, but it's, it's certainly something that um, has been studied um, and, and has, has been regulated over the years. The other thing that affects um, the solubility of gases in liquids is the pressure. So when we look at um, pressures, if we were to increase the pressure, 
that's going to increase the solubility. So we have an equation here, and we're going to need our calculators for the first time here. Um, we're looking at what's called Henry's law. And Henry's law essentially says that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas above that liquid. So here, okay, this is the molarity of the gas, the moles per liter. The K is just the proportionality constant that allows us to have an equation. And our P sub G is the partial pressure of the gas. So as we increase the partial pressure of the gas, we increase the concentration. They're directly proportional. So let's look at an example. Okay, it says a soft drink is bottled so that the uh, bottle at 25 degrees Celsius contains carbon dioxide, that's the carbonation, at a pressure of 5.0 atm over the liquid. Assume that the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is only 0 0.00040 atm. Calculate the equilibrium concentration, so we're trying to calculate C, for carbon dioxide in the soda at 25 degrees Celsius when it's been closed, and then after we open the bottle. And think about that. When you have a, a soda bottle and you open it up, you know, it makes that sound. Okay, that's because the um, solubility of the carbon dioxide is going down because the partial pressure above the liquid has gone down. So we're going to be using a Henry's law. Okay, the C stands for the concentration. That's what we're trying to figure out in this particular question. The partial pressure of the carbon dioxide is given to us above the liquid when the can is, or the bottle is closed. And then when the bottle is open, it would be equal to the atmosphere. And then it gives us what the constant, the proportionality constant K would be. So we wanna find out what would the concentration of carbon dioxide be when our bottle is closed and then what's the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the bottle after it's been opened? Okay, so I'll give you a minute, see if you can calculate those two values. Make sure when you're doing these problems, you write down the equation and then you plug in the numbers with the units and then you get your answer and your answer should have the right number of significant digits and it should have units to go along with it. Okay, so practice, you know, when we do these problems together, practice them kind of like you're looking at a test. Okay, just so that, you know, practice makes permanent the way that you, you know, do things in class is going to be the way that you're going to be doing them in, um, you know, on a test. All right, so let's look at the first one. Okay, we can calculate the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the unopened bottle by taking the proportionality constant, which was that 3.1 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per liter ATM and multiplying it by the um, partial pressure of the carbon dioxide above the liquid in the closed bottle. Okay, now a couple of things. Notice that I wrote the numbers and the units, which is something I would want to see on your test. So our proportionality constant is moles per liter ATM. We're going to multiply that by ATMs. The ATMs cancel out. That's where we're left with moles per liter or molarity, which is the units for concentration. And we have two significant digits in our proportionality constant, and we have two significant digits in our pressure. So we're going to have two significant digits in our concentration. In the open one, the proportionality constant is the same, but the pressure of the carbon dioxide above the liquid is significantly lower. And when we go to calculate our molarity, the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the liquid, we're going to notice that that value is significantly lower as well. And again, you know, two significant digits here, two significant digits here. So I'm rounding this to two significant digits. And it would be better to write this number in scientific notation. We wouldn't write 0 0.000012 for an answer. 
move that decimal five places, and that's where that 1.2 times 10 to the minus five comes from. A soda bottle that's closed is going to be carbonated. One that's opened is going to lose its carbonation. Okay, questions on uh, Henry's Law. A couple more terms. When we say um, we're looking at liquids that are um, miscible, okay, we're saying that um, they are substances that um, will um, mix with other substances. When we say something is immiscible, okay, we're saying that the liquids don't mix together. And then we could have things that are kind of in between. We could say that they're partially miscible. So now let's look at another solubility curve. So we've got solubility along the y-axis and we have temperature along the x-axis, but now we're looking at solids, okay? Generally speaking, for solids, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes up, okay? Now there are some exceptions like uh, the cerium three sulfate, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes down. But generally speaking, as the temperature goes up, the solubility for solids increases. Um, when we look at um, supersaturated solutions, okay, um, an example of that might be a hand warmer. So a hand warmer is prepared by warming up a solution, okay, and then dissolving a lot of solute in it, and then cooling it back down. Well, the solubility goes down when the temperature goes down. But if the solute's already dissolved in there, it may tend to stay dissolved. And if it does tend to stay dissolved, you have what's called a supersaturated solution. But it is not stable at all. And really, if you were to just shake it, okay, that's going to cause the solute particles which are above the saturation point to precipitate out of that solution. 